Hi, I'm Antoine Pietri, a PhD student in the Software Heritage Project. In this video, I'm going to present the article Forking Without Clicking by my advisor, Stefano Zacchiroli, Guillaume Rousseau, and myself. The goal of this article is to present new, more reliable methods of identifying software forks. First, let's review the reasons why researchers are interested in software forks. As most of the open source development nowadays happens on distributed version control systems, it is not always easy to find main repositories where the actual work happens and which are actively maintained. While most forks are only created temporarily as a way to contribute to a project, some development communities can also split and create hard forks of projects. These two types of forks have very different characteristics, but are both interesting to researchers. The software evolution and software health fields are looking at ways to identify common criteria and metrics for what makes forks successful. More broadly, forks are becoming a key element of study in the current open source development process, which means there is a growing need for methods to identify and categorize them. Historically, it appears that the main way forks have been studied in the literature is using forge-level metadata. Software forges, like GitHub or GitLab, provide in their API ways to get forking relationships between the repositories they host. These relationships correspond to what happens when you click on the fork button of a repository. In our article, we argue that there can be methodological issues with this approach, mostly in terms of exhaustiveness. First, this approach can only be used to identify forks that are all hosted on the same platform. The rise of GitHub alternatives like GitLab or Fabricator seems to be flattening the distribution curve of software forges, which shows the need for a cross-platform approach. It's also usually restricted to a single version control system, as most forges will not retain the information, for instance, if a repository was migrated from Mercurial to Git. Finally, it omits all the repositories that were manually cloned and pushed again, which is often the case for hard forks. It can also happen for projects not natively hosted on a specific platform, for instance, the Linux kernel. So, the main idea behind this work is this. What if we use software artifacts that are intrinsic to the repositories to establish a more robust way of identifying forks? We can actually look at the contents of the different repositories and see if they share some amount of development history to determine whether they are forks of each other. Put it simply, if for instance two repositories share the same commit or the same root directory, we can classify them as forks, which would get around the methodological problems of using the forge-level metadata. So, the main empirical question we want to answer in our article is this. How do the forks recognizable with forge metadata compare to the presence of shared code artifacts? Basically, we would like to get a quantitative sense of how close together the definitions of forking are, whether they are using forge-level metadata or artifacts from the development history. To answer this empirical question, we conduct an analysis using two datasets. The GHTorrent dataset is a periodical dump of all the GitHub public repositories and contains the forking relationships as they are declared on GitHub. This will be our baseline for the forge-level metadata. The Software Heritage Graph dataset contains a unified and deduplicated representation of the development history in the Software Heritage archive. You can think of it like a giant Git repository merging together all the publicly available repositories from different sources. We exploit this deduplicated representation to find the shared objects in the development history. As our experimental basis, we take the union of repositories that are found both in the DHTorrent dataset and in the Software Heritage Graph dataset. We leverage the Software Heritage data model to precisely define our intrinsic forks. It's a Merkle directed acyclic graph that is shown here. At the bottom level, you have blobs, the binary representation of the files in the archive. Above that, the directory trees that can either contain each other or contain blobs. Then commits, which represent the history of the repository. Tags, which represent named versions. Snapshots, which contain the list of branches and tags. And finally, repositories, which are our main object of interest when studying forks. So let's formally define the three types of forks that we want to compare using this data model. The first type of forks represent the usual approach. We say that A, 
is a forged fork of B, when the forged metadata does contain that forking relationship. In the pictured graph, B is a forged fork of A, and C and D are forged forks of B. Then we have the intrinsic fork definitions. For type 2 forks, we say that A is a shared commit fork of B when they have at least one commit in common. Here, A and B both contain commit number 1, so they are shared commit forks. Finally, type 3 forks. We say that A is a shared root directory fork of B when they both contain the same directory at the root level of one of their commits. Here again, it is the case for A and B, which both contain the directory number 1 at their root. To see how these three definitions quantitatively compare to each other, our first approach is to study fork networks, list of repositories that are connected together by forking relationships. We can partition the set of all the repositories in our datasets depending on the fork network to which they belong. To do this, we can simply run a connected components algorithm on the graph of development history. Shared artifacts will link together the repositories that belong to the same network. In the example shown, A, B, and C are part of the first network, D and E are part of the second network, and F is alone in the third network. Now here is the same algorithm running on a larger graph. To get a sense of how these repositories are distributed, we can plot the cumulative frequency for each network size, that is, the number of networks of size larger than n. When we run this algorithm on the entire graph, we get the distribution shown here in logarithmic scale. And this is how it looks for shared root directory force. Now we can superimpose the distribution of our baseline from the GHTorrent dataset. And we see that it's not very far from the distribution we find using the intrinsic definitions, which is encouraging. It suggests that we overlook between 4% and 16% of all repositories when we're using the forge fork definition as a source of truth, compared to the intrinsic forks. And keep in mind that we aren't even counting forks from other hosts here, so that is pretty significant. However, there is a very large discrepancy at the level of the largest giant networks shown here. It appears that the intrinsic definitions merge together a huge proportion of their repositories. The largest components are 15 and 150 times larger than for the forge forks, which is a very big difference. Our intuition for why this happens is this. Fork networks group together repositories that are only linked together by transitivity, not because they are forks of each other. In the example shown here, D, E, and F are grouped in the same network, even though D and F do not contain any shared commit. This can happen when merging two repositories with unrelated histories, or when using some advanced Git features like Git subtrees. In the article, we explore in more detail the aggregation process in these JN components, with statistical tools to understand them better. What we would need instead to get a distribution more comparable to what we see in our baseline, is to have a way to group together clusters of repositories that all happen to be forks of each other. We call them fork cliques. Now, naive algorithms to compute fork cliques are quadratic, as they require examining all repositories pairwise, which means they are unrealistic to execute. However, we can use a property of commit graphs to work around this. Because they usually present themselves in long degenerate chains, we can just run multiple traversals starting from the leaves. The algorithm to find clicks is as follows. First, we start from all the initial commits. For each of these, we walk back the commit chain, and all the repositories we find belong to the same click. We end up with a list of clicks, but now it cannot easily be compared with our baseline because they contain duplicates, as a single repository can appear in multiple clicks. So what we want to be able to compare the size distribution is to compute a partition function without duplicates, based on the clicks. 
To do so, we deterministically assign each repository to a single click by pruning all its further occurrences in the list. This pruning step has a high complexity, but it's generally fast when duplicates are rare, which is something we expect in this graph, and can be sped up with a reverse index. So here is the click finding algorithm applied on a larger graph. After a sorting phase, we can prune the duplicate repositories to get the p-click partition function. Then we can graph its cumulative frequency like before. And when we run this on the entire graph, we get the distribution shown here in log scale. And if we superimpose the GHTRN baseline, we get this. The largest components are now almost identical in size, which indicates that using repository clicks to identify intrinsic forks gives a result very close to what we would expect. Moreover, if we plot the difference between the two distributions, we see that our algorithm finds consistently more forks than what is indicated in the GitHub metadata. This is a good sign that our approach is more exhaustive and we are indeed able to complete the missing forking information using shared development history. We think there are a few main takeaways from this study. First, empirical studies looking at software forks should consider using fork definitions based on shared VCS artifacts. They can give the data more coverage and exhaustiveness, and make the study less susceptible to selection biases. If you have reasons to believe your results might be susceptible to the definition of fork you chose, it might be worth considering them as a threat to validity. Clusters of forks can be studied through the lenses of fork networks and fork cliques, depending on what the object of interest is and what relations are being looked at. And finally, fork p-clicks are a useful way to partition repository sets in groups of repositories that are all forks of each other, notably when doing quantitative analysis of forks.